Root of Evil is a production of C13 Originals, a division of Cadence 13, in partnership with TNT. Before we begin, we'd like to point out that this podcast will take a deep dive into the lives of the Hodel family, which inspired the TNT limited series, I Am the Night. If you're following along with both I Am the Night and this podcast, the podcast may address key events prior to those events occurring in the limited series. This story contains strong language and graphic and potentially disturbing content. Discretion is advised. Oh, yeah. Let me get to the Black Dahlia. When I was 11, my mother and I broke into George's house. She was on acid, of course. I did what I was told. I found a window or something like that. It was on the side, and I found a window, and I got in. And that was the first time I heard about George being dangerous. And he killed his secretary. I'd never heard that before. So we got inside there, and she's pointing out the place where she remembered a woman screaming in the basement. And then she told me she remembered a woman being hit over the head and buried by the stairs. So anyway, so we're in the house, and we're running around for a very long time. And uh, there's a silent alarm, which I didn't know about. But we were there for hours before any police were sent out. That was like when I was 11 or 12. That was my introduction to the deaths that happened at the house. That's when I first started hearing about the Black Dahlia. That story you just heard was my aunt describing the time she broke into a house with my grandmother when she was 11 years old. The house was my great-grandfather's, and his name was George Hodel. My sister and I heard crazy stories like this all the time growing up, from all of our family members, especially our mom. They said our great-grandfather was responsible for the most famous unsolved murder in American history. And they also said he did unspeakable things to our family. Things that have haunted us all for more than 70 years. It was only much later in life that we realized that all of these stories were true. I got that radio. Let me tell y'all a story. The more and more I learned about it growing up, I just thought, wow, I'm from a really dark family that's got a lot of fucked up things that I don't even know about. It's like one big happy party for them, and you're in the middle of it being victimized. Basically, my mom sold us. There's no two ways about it. The Hodel secrets. The George Hodel secrets. They're heavy They're shit. Heavy. This guy was majorly fucked up, worse than any I've ever seen or known. And he was my dad. We're all a little crazy, you know, you know but everybody is. <laughs> Sometimes you don't realize how much family baggage you have until you start digging. I got that radio. Welcome to Root of Evil, the true story of the Hodel family and the Black Dahlia. My name is Yvette. And I'm her sister, Rasha. And we're your hosts. Most of the people you'll hear from in this podcast are members of our family. Some we've been close with all our lives, and others we've barely met. But we all share the same Hodel blood and the pain that's associated with that. Now, for the first time, all of us have agreed to tell our story. The horrors of our past are hard to imagine and hard to believe. But everything you're going to hear is true. Here, I see go through that hole. Again. My sister Rasha and I are at the storage facility in San Francisco, where our mother kept so many things that were important to her and her unique life. If we're going to tell the Hodel story, it makes sense to start with our mom. Her name was Fauna Hodel, and she passed away in September of 2017. But she knew her entire life that she had a story to tell. She always wanted to write her autobiography. So for nearly three decades, she recorded interviews with friends and family, conversations, and read passages she was working on into a tape recorder. Yvette and I have never seen or heard any of it. But that's why we're here, at the storage facility, to try to find them and anything else that'll help tell her story. I'll bring it in. I got it. Ah, I did it, yes! Yay! Push. Maybe? Okay. Okay. All right, the only thing about the tarp. The tarp, you can't, it's so it's dark. dark. 
You could turn the phone flashlight on too, oh, yeah. you know. We have to move stuff out so we can kind of go through it. What's this one? Oh, this is our oh, family portrait. Holy, <laughs> oh my gosh. This is hysterical. Mom loved this picture. I hated I this hated picture. I hated this picture too. Like this big old earrings. Like, what was I thinking? Oh my god. Mom looks the best here though. Okay. I got it. Okay. Two hands, two hands. Okay. Let's see. Yeah, so this is what is this? There were stacks of journals filled with mom's poems and daily affirmations. Mom wrote 10904. Can you see it? You want me to yeah, read? yeah, no. I am crystal clear that this is my time. My daughters are strong, happy, proud of proud of me. Proud of me. <laughs> I am recognized for my work. That was 102104. I I'm getting so emotional because she's like saying, you know, I'm happy to be alive, alive yeah. and she's not here right now. And it this just makes me really sad. <laughs> It's like I just... Feels like she's here. <laughs> Our mom had a storage container for more than 20 years. It makes us feel closer to her being here, but it also reminds us how hard it is without her. Rush, I'm going to get another box, okay? Okay. I need, I, yeah, I need help. Okay. Just put it down on the ground. Okay. Look what I found! Shut your <gasps> face. Oh my God. Tamar, age 48. What is all that? Cassette tapes. Mm. I think this is the jackpot. Oh, wow. Yeah. This is it. This is it. It was a box filled with dusty old cassette tapes. None had cases, and most weren't even labeled. A few had the names of mom, friends of hers, and her birth mother, Tamar, written on them. Nobody has ever heard them until now. Okay. All right, well, let's get right in. All right, let's hear something. What is, and now I'm free. Oh, this one says, and now I'm free, too. Well, let's just listen to it and see what it is. Yeah, let me put it in. Moving? Volume. And now I am free. That's in mom. reflection, she sounds like, yeah. from the age of 12, I knew my story would be written. Why? I had a mother who was a drunk. She detested me, and I detested her drinking. Mama was black, and I was white. Growing up in the late 50s and early 60s, with such odds, I knew if we outlived the circumstances, this would be a story to tell. One lie, one little white lie, caused me to fight for the rest of my life. That's mom's voice and she's reading a passage from her manuscript about her childhood. Her life began under the strangest of circumstances and got more strange from there. Probably from the age of five or six, Mama started telling me about my real family. She told me that she was working at the Riverside Hotel as a maid in the restroom. She came across this lady one day who asked her if she wanted a baby. Strange question to ask her, but this lady had seen my mother in the bathroom several times, and apparently she'd taken a liking to my mother. Mama said, what, a baby? What do you mean? The lady went on to explain to her that a friend of hers, daughter, was expecting a baby. The baby was going to be mixed, mixed with Negro and white. This was 1951. And it wasn't every day that a black woman was approached by a white woman, especially in a casino bathroom, and asked if she wanted to adopt a baby. She didn't take this lady serious. Well, a couple of months passed by, and this lady came back to the lounge where Mama was working and asked her why didn't she come to pick up the baby. Mama said, what baby? You know, what are you talking about? The baby, which was our mother, was named Fauna Hodel. Her birth mother, Tamar Hodel, was only 15 years old. And when Tamar told her parents that the father was black, they decided that the baby should be given up for adoption. Here's mom again from a different tape. Well, um, back then, even if you were a quarter colored or whatever, you were considered uh, tainted, you know, and if a white girl was pregnant by supposedly a black man, the white folks back then weren't about to let this child be kept, and no one questioned. Tamar's mother, Dorothy Barb, promised her that they'd find a nice, rich black family to raise her baby. But she never intended to keep that promise. Instead, Dorothy asked her friend to find someone to take the baby. Her friend liked to gamble, and she took trips from San Francisco, where Fauna was, to the Riverside Casino in Reno, Nevada. And that's where she met Jimmy Lee Faison a bathroom attendant at the casino, and urged her to adopt a biracial baby who she said was born to a very powerful family. 
My mother, the lady whom I call my mother is Jimmy Lee Faison, who's been dead for many years now, but her husband was a shoeshine man in that casino, and he was also a Pentecostal minister, and he was quite concerned that his wife was starting to drink a bit. And they had no children of, of their own, and he thought this was truly a sign from God that maybe this would be perfect. This would settle her down, and she wouldn't drink anymore. Mom sat in the hospital for a month waiting to be adopted. And then Jimmy Lee finally agreed to come get her. But when she saw the baby, she didn't look biracial at all. She had strawberry blonde hair and blue eyes. Jimmy Lee knew she couldn't take such a white-looking baby named Fauna Hodel back to her neighborhood. So she decided to call her Patty, a slang name for a white girl. And back in Sparks, Nevada, her new home, Fauna Hodel became Pat Faison, Jimmy Lee's adopted biracial daughter. But it wasn't that simple. As a little girl, I was black, and no one could tell me any different. I didn't care what color my skin was. My mother, every step of the way, had, there never was a time I wasn't being explained that the, the mother's white, the father's black, and one day she'll darken. I saw the looks. I saw uh, the people who were always pointing. Oftentimes, when mixed children are born, they're much lighter and they darken. On mom's birth certificate, her name was listed as Fana Hodel. And Tamar Neis Hodel was listed as the mother. But for the father, there was no information given, other than his race, Negro. And growing up, that was mom's proof to everyone that she was black. All I ever had was my birth certificate, and it actually said father Negro, name withheld on it. So I actually wore that around like a badge, thinking that would make me be black, you know. She was my cousin, and to be my cousin, she had to have black blood in her. That's cousin Inez. She and mom were really close growing up, and Inez believed mom was black. Here, the two of them are laughing about the lengths mom would go to prove it. And I used to tell my friends when I got older, I have a cousin that she's black, but she looks white, and she could have the flattest ass I've ever seen. That's why I used to tell my friends, I said, she talks like she's black and she's been around black, but she her ass was like a, a white person. I don't know where she got that from. <laughs> her skin was always real fair. She always looked thick, but she was so pale. She must have been in sixth grade, and I had, she had came over to visit me, and she had this golden tan, and I said, oh, you have a nice tan, you look really good, but she looked really good, because I had never seen her color, but she looked colored, because it was QT, QT, the quick tan. I said, oh, Kat, you look so good with that tan. The only thing is, it doesn't wash off the hand, so when you put it on, you should use rubber gloves, because otherwise, you see these golden palms, and I said, God dang, look at those hands. The QT, the quick tan. Mom also put baby oil on her skin and would bake in the sun to try to get darker. This was around the time she started doing a lot of writing in diaries and journals. One of the poems Russia and I found in her storage container is called Childhood Dreams. And it goes, Most of my friends wish for toys. Not only did I wish, I prayed for God to give man the knowledge to develop a pill that would darken my skin. At home, Jimmy Lee called mom White Patty. Her drinking had gotten much worse as mom was growing up. And Jimmy Lee was an angry drunk. And even angrier when she didn't drink. My life was pretty rough when I was real young. I can constantly remember my mother was in jail quite a bit. She had started drinking heavily. She was fighting constantly. One particular night, I was washing the dishes. I had poured out one of my mother's drinks. Uh, she drank gin. That was her favorite drink. looked like water. I could have poured it out by mistake. My mother came into the kitchen where I was. She was looking for a drink. She couldn't find it. She realized that I had poured it out. She started beating me. She threw me on the floor. She had me down on the floor with a broom in her hand. 